Hello everyone and welcome to Punk Lotto Pod, the game where no one wins. I'm your co-host Justin Hensley. I'm your other co-host Dylan Hensley. And this is the show where using a number generator and the Rate Your Music punk charts, we pick a year, album, and EP at random to discuss. Which we're not doing this time. <laughs> but we're not doing any of that today. <laughs> so, seeing Not as- even half a year into uh, our podcast and we're breaking format like every other episode (laughs) it's so easy we have all these opportunities to do gimmick episodes (laughs) Uh, and what's a podcast for other than gimmicks yeah yeah hey the halloween episodes are some of our most listened to episodes so (laughs) yeah like our fest episode was still like the best first week of downloads or something yeah so what are we doing this time all right so so, seeing as it is now uh, 2019, <laughs> yes, it is 2019, uh, we decided to take a look back at the year 2018 and uh, uh, make a, um, a best, uh, this, so this is basically, this is part one of our two part top ten albums of 2018. We decided to break it into two because it'd be a very long episode if we just did one. Um so they're gonna be long episodes anyway right yeah because we're gonna be talking about five albums today instead of the one album and one ep that we normally do um so this is one of my favorite things to do uh for the last couple of years i have been writing best of lists on like various different blogs like either if it was just like my personal blogs or if it's ones that you know we were writing together um just i love making best of lists i love it so much that i spend a majority of the year listening to new music as with a list in mind for the end of the year so like i keep track of everything i listen to um specifically all the way through or like at least over half the album if i listen like one or two tracks and i'm like "Mm, pass i don't need to write down that i passed on this album um so i listened to just shy of 200 releases this year that includes albums eps and singles um probably like in the (laughs) upper 180s or so i listened to like 15 (laughs) maybe yeah um (laughs) i don't know but you've been working on music, so that's something. <laughs> well, I was talking to someone <clears throat> recently about this because he was asking, like, what I guess he was uh, he was asking, like, what I had been listening to this year, like new stuff or whatever, and, and like I only named a couple things, and I was like, you know, I've I've listened to a lot of other stuff this year that was somewhat new to me that isn't new music. So mm-hmm. it's not like I wasn't listening to music or even exploring music. I was just spending more time with other things um you know deep diving on classics more than yeah than new music so yeah when i did that spotify wrapped thing um the most listened to artist i had this year was teenage fan club so yeah i listened to a lot of teenage fan club this year um yeah other stuff like that too um just like artists with big discographies that i haven't like fully explored to the fullest uh you know like i I did that too, and so that's like Super Chunk. I think was another one. It's like, well, they have ten albums or eleven albums, so like I wanted to listen to, you know, all, you know, everything they put out. And because they have so much material that when you're done listening to it all once, you want to go back through it again, you know. But then, like as far as other, for the most part, I I'd say I listen to seventy five percent of the music I listened to this year was released this year, and the other twenty five percent was older music. I don't know. Maybe I'd say 50-50 then. That's probably more accurate. Speaking of Super Chunk, for some reason, every time I type Google into Super Chunk, I keep seeing Super Chunk Scottsdale come up as a suggested search. And I'm like, what What does Super Chunk have to do with Scottsdale? And I just finally actually looked at it, and there's like a, there's like a bakery called Super Chunk in Scottsdale. <laughs> you should go there and see what the... <laughs> if there's a, there's a fan there. <laughs> yeah so well um and it's still funny because like even though i listened to almost 200 albums i still feel like i didn't listen to enough uh like there are genres that i kind of barely scratched the surface with this year like uh 
like hardcore and metal and hip hop. Like I barely listened to anything from those genres. Um, yeah, I don't think I listened to really any hardcore. Yeah, or metal this year at all. I just I don't know. I, nothing appealed to me. Everything that everything still seems like super dumb <laughs> in hardcore, and I'm just not into that. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like a little. I said there is like. There's something going on in hardcore right now that's it's kind of like bubbling. Like there's some smarter stuff, like Eco Strike and uh, what that Candy album was really popular. And, uh, and uh, what else? Yeah, but like Vane is like the biggest hardcore album this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's funny. It looks like metalcore and mathcore had like a crazy good year. So like Vane. <laughs> sectioned frontier the armed architects like they all they all have albums in like the top of the charts so yeah let's let's go ahead and preface this uh normally whenever we do an episode we we take a look at the year that's come out you know that the albums came out in and um discuss and like try to figure out the trends were so looking at the 2018 charts um yeah like weirdly mathy metalcore was back in the front you know yeah I, I, i'm seeing that too and i, I know it kind of skews on the rate your music charts because these are also the type of albums that rate well on the metal charts and like yeah, so if they have like an overlap into like metal core or math core then it shows up in the punk chart so it metal is overrepresented sort of in the punk charts yeah yeah the uh and we've talked about this before but the user base for rate your music is is very like nerdy and very metal focused and very like experimental mm-hmm. those the people that are using rate your music are more into those styles of music than like more pop oriented music or punk yeah, it, it doesn't. So it always it, throws off the charts. It, I, n- I never feel like we get the most accurate picture, but well, it, it's funny looking at. So if we're just going by these charts, the big trend is, like I said, metalcore and mathcore. Um, but I think hardcore in general had a big year because there's there was a, a Birds and Row album that did really well, uh, Jesus Peace, Cult Leader. Uh, turnstile people really love that drug church album um yeah there's that gouge away record yeah the hers collective um and then so like heavy did well this year and i'm wondering if that's gonna be like the thing that people look back on in like five years and go okay yeah heavy was the thing for 2015 or 2019 um 2018 god what year is it do you (laughs) Do you feel like this is maybe indicative of our kind of our do you think maybe this confirms our theory to a degree about the mid 2000s and the popularity of heavy music then as sort of like a cathartic out, outlet for a lot of uh social and political anxiety and frustration? Well, I mean, it only helps confirm the theory more. I mean, it's just looking at it even the more punk based like the sort of like the indie punk the pitchfork punk as i like to call it even all of it is like on the darker side for the most mm-hmm. part so like your ice age and preoccupations and bambara and ought like those are all dark sounding albums um two big british punk albums this year were idols and shame and those are very dark sounding punk albums, um, which I very much enjoy both of those albums. Idols actually is number two on the overall chart for punk, which is pretty awesome. But it's funny. But then you look at number one is Parquet Court's new, uh, album Wide Awake, and it, that's that's kind of a peppy upbeat album. So that, that one's sort of an outlier as far as the trends. Um, yeah, I mean people have just been so into that band for the last couple years they're always Mm -hmm. really highly praised though you know it's really interesting i'm surprised that dose your dreams by fucked up isn't on the first page you know within the top 20 because of how 
hyped that record was. Well, it was kind of a late entry to the year, though, wasn't it? Like Not it that came- late. I feel like it came out early enough to have been considered, and especially considering that it would have been sent out to yeah. publications even earlier. So, I mean, it showed up on it. a it showed up on a lot of uh, magazine and website end of year lists. So, I mean, those people were rating it higher. I mean, this is user based, so it's yeah. A little weirder. Um, yeah, yeah I guess just considering its its critical reception, I'm surprised it's not higher. But yeah, because usually the top albums do kind of reflect a critical consensus as well. I mean, yeah, Parquet Courts was huge with critics, and it's also number one. And then even like the more mainstream charts, like uh, Car Seat Headrest, was number one for a majority of the year, and which is funny because it's just them re-recording an older album they made. I don't know why that was so critically acclaimed and why people <laughs> loved it so much, but whatever. Um, so they do kind of reflect what what what's being pushed essentially by journalists, <laughs> music journalism. It's funny, even like the actual punky stuff that appeals more to what younger people. Or, like, actual punk subculture people. Like, emo did well. Um, I guess we're still in the middle of a weird wave of emo. It, But it's funny, because, like, the, there aren't that many big names in it anymore. Like, the highest emo album on the list is TTNG. Mm-hmm. I don't know who that is. This Town Needs Guns. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, they when did they change? They change officially the- changed their name to that. A couple of years ago, just because of all of the gun violence. Oh, well, that's <laughs> kind of like, cool. Is, uh, huh. Their name is still technically "This Town Needs Guns," though. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like and, AJJ, like yeah. And then at number thirty-seven is Young Jesus. It's kind of got a Midwest emo thing. Uh, it's funny. It takes all the way until number 45 to get anything kind of poppy, I guess. That's not Parquet Courts. That's not indie rock. Like, The Wonder Years is number 45. And it's like the first big pop punk or like punk rock album on the chart. Everything else is like indie rock, post-punk, hardcore, post-hardcore, you know, all the heavy stuff. And then what... That Fiddlehead album is number 56, and it's, it's, they call it a post hardcore emo album, but it's more like a Sam I Am album than any of those, which I <laughs> guess that's cool. And then right below that is Alkaline Trio is this thing Cursed, which was very close to making it on, on the, uh, our list of albums for the year. Um, and then what, Large Jane Grace and the Devouring Mothers. So it's like, we talked about it kind of throughout the year, but it seems like, punk rock had a real down year this year as its own genre you know yeah i think a lot of it was just kind of like yeah i don't know is no one in the punk community really wanted to write anti-trump records (laughs) i'm wondering if they were worried it wasn't gonna age well but i don't know there is one band on our list that definitely wrote an anti-trump record yeah i mean and we could talk more about that when we talk about it because that was something I actually wanted to say about it. But yeah. in general, like I, I get the feeling that most artists are just like, I don't want to write about that. Like I don't want to spend any more time thinking about that. That is true. Because that, that's the thing. Like you've got to write the songs and you've got to arrange them and you've got to spend all this time <laughs> with them and then record them. And like, yeah, it's it's. It's That's more too much rewarding. brain power being devoted to. Yeah. It's more rewarding to talk about the overall anxiety. And more therapeutic, I guess, than rewarding. To talk about, yeah, like the anxiety and stress of living in this era than it is to specifically write about the things that are making you stressed <laughs> and full of anxiety. Um, and plus, we'll stay on time a little better. Because... Think about, like, oh, those Rock Against Bush albums sure are uh, relevant today, you know. How much anti-flag do you listen to now? Or gonna die, you? gonna die, you're gonna die for your <laughs> government. 
<laughs> How often do you listen to American Idiot? I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, I guess let's just go ahead and start talking about our albums because I feel like we did. This is already going to take us a long time, and we just spent <laughs> twenty minutes talking about the year. Um, so I'll go first, and I'll be number ten. Uh, we each basically just came up with five albums each to discuss, and um, some some of these would make it in my top ten overall. So this isn't a collaborative top ten; it's more of a our personal top fives. But yeah, so. Um, I'll go. Number 10 is Ogi Kubo Station. We can pretend like. Records. Uh, this is the. I've never been sure if that's how you pronounce their name. Ogi Kubo. I think so. Uh, it's as from what I can tell, it's named after a railway station in Tokyo. So, which is interesting because yeah, you don't think these musicians have a connection to Japan specifically. But um, so this is Mara Weaver of the mixtapes and Boys. And Mike Park of Asian Man Records, uh, <laughs> Skank and Pickle, uh, Bruce the Lee Band, Bruce The Chinkies, Kitty Cat Fan Club, Solo Music. So, so many albums, which I love Mike Park. He Mike Park doesn't get enough credit. For being one of the most important figures of, pop, of punk rock in the last 20 years. Yeah. Like, if you made, like, a list of, like, the... Who would be the top five most influential punks of the last 20 years? You'd have Mike Park, Large and Grace, maybe Damien Abraham, Jacob Bannon. I mean, you, you get into heavy music, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and just like, just Asian Man Records, just the records that they put out. Yeah. I mean, Alkaline Trio, Lawrence yeah. Arms, a million ska records. Uh, even in the last couple of years, he did Lemuria and HHA. You know, people who wound up being pretty big. I mean, um, like um, Big D and the Kids Table, and they've done this bomb the music industry. And yeah, that's true. Um, he enabled Jeff Rosenstock. <laughs> yeah, <sighs> his one crime. <clears throat> Wait a minute! I just realized when we were going through the list, did you see Jeff Rosenstock on there anymore? No. That's weird, because all year long that dumb album was in the top like 100 and i haven't seen it on the top four or the four pages everybody got on rate your music and rated everything probably in the last week or so yeah i guess everyone's (laughs) reflecting on the end of the year and making their lists (laughs) that's so funny so it got pushed way down that thing was like in the top 10 most of the year and now it's like where is it i never even saw it i went pretty far back wow swinging utters are rated higher than that (laughs) That album is so mediocre. Um, that came out this year, right? Like, I'm not imagining... Yeah, it definitely came out this year. Worry? Was that what it's called? Well, Unless it... somebody messed with the... No, Pop Punk's one of the genres. So, like, yeah, Post. Post was the one that came out this year. Worry was the one in 2016. I did not see Post on that chart. That is so weird. 
I don't, I must have overlooked it, but anyway, yeah, Ogi Kubo Station, so, um, did you listen to this album? Yeah. Yeah, it's really good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think of so, your records, this was my favorite. Yeah. The records that you picked for the year, but. Yeah. Um, Mara was the better songwriter in mixtapes, which was unfortunate because she probably wrote like a third of the songs in the band. Um, yeah. And when mixtapes fell apart, the thing I wanted the most was for Mara to have, like, start a new band where she was, like, the, the lead singer. And she started Boys, which was a good band, but they only released, like, one EP and one split. And Mara's not the only singer in the band. I think, like, she only sings a couple of the songs. So it's like, oh, this is not, you know, this is not what I want. I want just Mara. And... So in tw- in 2014, Mike Park posted a video for a song called Weak Souls Walk Around Here, and it featured Mara Weaver on it. And it wound up being like my favorite song of that entire year. And there wasn't an album, there wasn't an EP, it wasn't a single, it was just a random song thrown online for people to hear. They made a little video where they're in a car singing the song, like there's it's like a split screen video where she's driving her car and he's driving his car and they're singing the song together. And I remember thinking is like, man, their voices work so well together. Like, yeah, that's a really good pairing. Yeah. It's a, that's a really good pairing of just caliber of artists, like two artists who can completely stand on their own collaborating and making really good music Yeah, and singing with each other in in a way to where they don't they're not it doesn't seem like they're competing with each other it doesn't Mm -mm. they're not overlapping each other like it's not too much because a lot of times you get like those kind of collaborations with like two really great artists and they just don't make good music together well a lot of times it's just like well this is uh it's very could easily just been this is mara's song this is mike's song but these really feel like songs that they both wrote i mean i'm sure somebody wrote the actual songs and melodies of each one individually but there's a collaborative nature to this album that you don't find with two strong musicians working together so well like i'd say mara probably takes the lead as far as her voice is the more dominant one on the album and she takes the lead more often like you know she's she sings solo more often than Mike sings solo. Yeah. But and a, but a majority of the album is just harmonies, like them together, um, or alternating, you know, lines. And uh, it's just such a great album. It's funny. I looked at the... So it's a... Uh, it's um, let's see. They released an EP last year that was entirely acoustic that I loved. It was one of my favorite releases of last year. And so... With the new album, I expected kind of more just like straight acoustic stuff, but they actually went full band for most of the album. Yeah, Dan Pothas plays on the this record. Yeah, and I was looking. Yeah, Dan Pothas plays piano and slide guitar, and there is one specific song that I think that slide guitar is featured prominently. Um, they also have Justin Amans from Kitty Cat Fan Club on drums, which is Mike Park's other band, but he doesn't sing in that one. Like, Jeff Rosenstock does some synths on the album. Yeah. And then, like, Zach Quinn from Pears plays guitar on this album, too. So it's it's a lot of just them getting their friends together to play on the album. I love it. And that song, Weak Souls Walk Around Here, they do a full band version on the album as well. And it's probably the highest energy song on the whole album. I do still prefer that acoustic version. I would love for that to have actually shown up on a release somewhere, but you can go look it up on YouTube. That video is still there. It's such an amazing song. I don't know. I love it. It's just full of, like, sweet melodies, and it's just charming. Like, it's great. Yeah, I really like this record a lot. I wish I had listened to it earlier in the year because I I would have greatly enjoyed it and it may have made my list, but uh, my top five, but... um, this record is the kind of like i feel like this is the kind of record that i wish more bands made like just well-written songs Mm -hmm. just with really good musicians playing on it i mean like it seems it sounds so simple like it's 
that just sounds like what bands should be, but there's so much music that's just like riff based or, you know, like really hung up on maybe like a certain instrument or a certain sound as like the driving factor. And this just feels like an organic record that really capable songwriters made. Like it just feels like, Oh, let's, let's add something different to this, to this song. Like it's not like we need to have keyboards slamming all over this whole record. Like (laughs) it's just like tasteful use of other instrumentation. That's really nice. But yeah. at its core, it's just your basic, you know, form- it's definitely band one, formula. But it's what you would really just say, like a singer songwriter album would be. Like it's the focus is more on the songwriting than I don't know. I think I read somewhere that they wanted to make a very simple album, and this uh, and simple isn't an insult in this case. It's just it's just not too many parts, not too many element over you know overset you know i don't know throwing too many instruments on it or you know just focusing on them mara and mike they're singing it's not so much what they're playing but it's more what they're singing in the melodies that they came up with for the album i don't know i really i really love it it's um it's definitely one of the bright spots of the year and i'm kicking myself for not going to see them when they played in chapel hill they opened for alkaline trio i did not know they were opening for alkaline trio until the day of and my and our friend caleb who went to the show posted on facebook mike park is so awesome and i was like what What he's saying (laughs) this and then i realized oh fuck okikobo (laughs) station is opening for alkaline trio on this tour and they came to charlotte i didn't think they were coming out on the entire tour they were on that leg they weren't on the leg that came through here which I also did not go see Alkaline Trio when they played here. Because it was like, I want to say when they came through Phoenix, it was like after Fest? Maybe. Maybe, or it was like in October. No, yeah, it was in October, and it was like right after my anniversary. So we had just been out of town like the weekend before the show, and I just didn't want to go to a show and spend more money, and I hadn't really listened to that Alkaline Trio record, and I knew they were going to play a lot from it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I'm kicking myself, because I believe, and I could have gone to that show, it was like a Tuesday night, and I didn't have to work the next day, so it was like something I very easily could have gone to, I was just like, well, fest is soon, I think that was my thinking, and yeah, it's also a two and a half hour drive, but I would have made the drive if I'd have realized that they were playing, because Mike Park doesn't come to the East Coast very often, uh, he doesn't tour very often in general, he even admitted, like, on f- I think it was a Facebook post this year. He was like, I don't normally tour because uh, I just don't like being on the road and away from my family. <laughs> yeah. I mean, understand. he also runs that label. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So he's got to mail out those Jeff Rosenstock records. Uh, I wish Fest would just like offer him a shitload of money and like he could come and do like a couple different sets of different things. And <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you want to, you want to. All right. So, on? um, Moving on to the next album on our list, number nine. Uh, It is Photo Crime, Principle of Pain. No source 
of heat Cigarette burn sheets The place where our legs meet The rose in the thorn The sharp boys in the leaf The long place between in the floor, the sharp point in the leaf, the long place between you and me. was released through Auxiliary Records, which was which is basically their label. Uh, so it was basically self-released. Uh, mm. Photo Crime is R Pattern, or <laughs> better known as Ryan Patterson of Coliseum, uh, Black God, Black Cross, uh, other Louisville hardcore bands we've mentioned in previously. We talked about Coliseum. Um, <clears throat> is this a... This is like the third episode in a month that we've been yeah. <laughs> mentioned Coliseum and Ryan Patterson. Um, yeah, it was it was recorded with Jay Robbins, who did the last couple of Coliseum records. Um, oh, did he really? I did not realize he did this album. Mm-hmm. I re- um, I was reading something about it. He uh, Ryan wrote and demoed like this whole record over the last year or so, um, and he didn't play anything from it for anyone <laughs> until he went to record it. Wow. So then he went to went to Maryland and he basically recorded the whole thing. Like oh, this record drum is, machine. is basically him. Um Photo Crime is listed I mean it, he he lists Nick Thineman uh on guitar and vocals and Shelly Anderson on bass and vocals. I'm not sure how much they played on the record. They may have contributed a little bit, but it seems very much like he did it all himself. Yeah. Um, it also has there's there's appearances by Jay Robbins uh, and Janet Morgan, uh, who is Jay Robbins' wife, um, mm. <clears throat> as well as Pete Moffat from Government Issue. Um, other than the, I'm guessing Janet maybe did the or Shelley did the female vocals that are on this record. Hmm. Um, I'm not 100 percent on that, but yeah, I, this record. I didn't really dig into it. I listened to it a little bit earlier this year. It, this is a record that could have gone higher on my list if I had spent more time with it. Um, I listened to it a few times in the last couple weeks or so, prepping for this episode, and it's so good. <laughs> oh, it is so good. It's, um, it's like that, uh, I guess you would call it dark wave. Yeah, goth rock. Um it reminds me a lot of um, st- uh, some bands that I actually dug into a lot this year and spent a lot of time listening to, um, like Jesus and Mary Chain and uh, Echo and the Bunny Men and um, a little Psychedelic Furs a little bit. There's something to the general sound and feel of the record that really reminds me of those bands. More more like the like Darklands or Automatic uh, Jesus and Mary Chain, not so much the first Jesus and Mary Chain album. Yeah. Which, that's more on the, the noise pop side, but but like the use of synths and reverb and just dark vibes. I mean, I got a lot of Sisters of Mercy yeah. in so, there, yeah. too. It, 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 and then even like some De- even Depeche Mode in there. and uh, Yeah. <clears throat> this is this is very much the record. I, this seems like a the exact record that Ryan Patterson has been wanting to make for the last couple of years. Um, it strips away a lot of the heaviness of Coliseum and mm-hmm. just really focuses on the mood. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this it's this record is just like cool driving music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was... This came out pretty early in the year. It was like February or March. No, it was May. Whoa, it was really that late in there? Yeah. Because I went and saw them. Um, if you give me a second, I'll tell you what month that was. Okay, I went and saw them in April. So for some reason, I thought it was earlier in the in the year. Uh, yeah, they came through on tour 
with Relayers, which I believe is like a Pelican side project. Hmm. And I went to Asheville to go see them, and there were not a lot of people there, unfortunately. Um, but it was so fucking good. It was um, Nick and who'd you say the... Shelly. Shelly, yes. Base. Ryan, Nick, and Shelly, and the drum machine. The drum machine uh, is named Mother. Yeah. <laughs> Which is great. And uh, they were so incredible. Um, they utilize like a light show, essentially, um, that and a fog machine, which normally the fog machines are tacky, but it, it totally works for like the mood that they're going for. I love the... Um, I want to pull this up, actually, because their, their copy, like, it's so dramatic. Um <laughs> Uh, forging a connection between the shadows of the underbelly of the mid-century American dream, the ghostly corners of post-war Europe, and the present moment. Photo crime breathes new life into Cold War paranoia, modern-day malaise, and smoky noir. <laughs> um, <laughs> they reference, like, they even specifically reference their in like their pre- press release or something. Uh, they reference the uh, the fog machine. Yeah, found drenched in fog with sunglasses on and collar upturned toward the world. Photo crime commands both pleasure and pain with unshakable cool determination. <laughs> yeah, this is, and this is just a really inspiring record. Uh, like knowing how he worked on it entirely by himself, <laughs> that's really relatable. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's basically what I've been doing for the last year. Yeah, <sighs> just alone, losing. <laughs> sanity um <laughs> yeah this is funny this was like an early contender for album of the year for me like it it's been a good chunk of the year and i was like this is probably my favorite album of the year and it was so it's just it's such a good album that i almost thought i like dark wave for a minute <laughs> i was like i'm gonna listen to other dark wave albums when they come out this year and i was, nothing came close yeah to being as good as this one and i was like oh i don't really like dark wave i just like this really good album <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like, there's just a thumping post-punk drive to it that I don't feel like you get from most other dark wave artists. And, yeah. And there's some grit, and there's... Ryan's also just, like, a really great guitar player. Mm-hmm. Like, very rhythm-based, but, I don't know, in that kind of, like, like uh, I want to say, like, almost like in a Hot Snakes kind of way, to where there's, like, kind of a lead edge to the rhythm playing. Um he uses like some 12 strings on there there's some excellent um i'm pretty sure he uses like a baritone guitar at some point because there's just this super drippy like deep plunky guitar line on one of the songs um it's just like it's just like a compressed baritone guitar through really drippy reverb and i just love that sound like it just gives Mm -hmm. me chills he's he's got a really good sense of texture and mood and there's there's a lot of sparseness and there's a lot of breathing room for every part on the album it's it's killer yeah yeah this is an album that is in my top 10 and yeah yeah it's definitely in my top 10 overall as well um my personal 10 this record came almost didn't make it on my list because i was thinking i was leaning maybe towards that uh alkaline trio record but then I listened to this one again just to kind of see, and I was like, yeah, no, it's it's this record. Because um, I revisited that Alkaline Trio record, too, and it just still doesn't click. And something that I want to I talk about this, because I almost brought it up when we were talking about the, our, the, our last record. Um, did you notice that the first song on Is This Thing Cursed is 100% a rehash of a Dan Andriano song from his... Uh, from Party Adjacent, his last solo record. You know, I kind of thought it's so. the well, first. Well, it's like the first song on that record. <laughs> it does start like the exact same way. It's the same. Like I compared them like side by side. It's like the same chord progression, same vocal <laughs> melody, just different lyrics. Yeah, I yeah, prefer but... the Party Adjacent version. <laughs> well, yeah, th- th- I think Party Adjacent is the better album than Is This Thing Cursed, but. I do think is this thing cursed the be- is the best Aqualine Trio album since Crimson. I can see that. I really connected with uh, their last album, but oh, that's great. That's the one right. I mean, I'll put that right right after Crimson. 
uh, what's that one called? Um, My Shame is True. Yeah. Yeah, that album's way better than, what, This Addiction. Agony and uh, Irony. Yeah. yeah. Is there something else, or is that all of them? Damnesia, the acoustic thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remains, the compilation. I keep seeing yeah. someone post a uh, an Alkaline Trio uh, acoustic guitar on Craigslist around Phoenix. <laughs> it's that one with, like, the their heart design for the sound <laughs> hole. <laughs> you just started being with that guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, do you want to move on to the next sure. record? Unless you have anything pressing to say about Photogram. No, no. Uh, five out of five. Uh, but really, every, just about everything on this list is five out of five for me. So it wouldn't have made it the top ten. I have plenty of albums that I would also consider five out of fives that didn't make the list. So yeah, but that's a great album. And it is it is what... It was the obvious next step that I think Coliseum would have wound up taking had the band continued and and i guess him then embracing the things that probably wouldn't have quite fit on a coliseum record too so i don't know i'm hoping it works for him and it does become something that he can sustain it's very much the kind of thing that he could very easily just keep doing records like this by himself um Mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily tour kind of do like Jason Martin from Starflyer 59 and just make your own records and yeah. just release one every couple of years and yeah there's some that's a that's another good comparison actually to make cuz there's some there's some guitar work on here that really reminds me of Jason Martin um and just the general production reminds me of those latter Starflyer 59 records but uh yeah moving on to your next entry yeah. so this is number 8 and it is Fourth Wanderers and their album titled Fourth Wanderers. Sub Pop Records, which is not the only Sub Pop record on this list. Um, uh, so they are originally from Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, they the band consists of one, two, three, four, five people who I believe all went to high school together. They were like a high school band together, and guitarist uh, Ben Gutterell originally sent the lead singer Ava Trilling songs just because he had a crush on her and he just like wanted her involved in his musical project so and then it actually wound up turning into like a full band and I believe a majority of the band was a year older than Ava and so the band wound up releasing a couple two EPs trying to remember like trying to figure out remember the timeline so they've released two eps and two albums one is like a mini album and came out while ava was like a senior in high school and they even got tweeted by lord like she was tweeting about them weird 
like their songs when um while Ava was still in high school, which is crazy. Like just imagine being a high schooler and like one of the biggest most well known musicians in the country is tweeting about your songs. Well in the world. Lord is from <laughs> New Zealand, right? Oh, uh, that is true. Or she's Australia. not even American. Yeah. But I mean she's huge in America, which uh, yeah, worldwide means she's probably way bigger. Um and so the members are kind of spread out across the country. Uh, ben is in Ohio. Ava is in New York. Um, I want to say one of the other guys is in Boston. So, like, they're kind of all attending college. And then, like, the other guys are still in New Jersey. And so it's basically a long-distance band where they just send parts back and forth. So Ben is the main songwriter, and what he does is he'll create i guess like the basic outline of the song using his guitar he'll send it to ava she'll come up with the melodies and the um the lyrics to the album and then when those two are done then they bring in the rest of the band and then i'll like flush it out as a full band thing um it's such a good album it's this i I had a hard time trying to figure out exactly what type of music it is so it's this sort of indie rock more punk leaning sound um I, like i put it in the vein of like uh level up sort of and like uh rat boys who are really popular right now too which i'm also told is the built to spill sound yeah i don't, I don't know yeah <laughs> this i could see built to spill sebado some of those earlier like 90s indie rock bands being a big influence um Kind of angular, mm-hmm. kind of jangly, but not like a straight up, you know, jangle pop album. Like it, it, some real loose sounding chords and um, the the song structures are a little unusual. Yeah, the so like the the primary focus of the album is definitely the guitar playing and the vocals, and so they they work together so well. I don't. I, it's like the guitar is another voice on the album, essentially, and it's a do du- like a duet between a guitar and a a human. I don't know how else to describe it. I don't know what uh, what did you think of this one? Um, this one didn't click for me. Uh, hmm. It felt a little too disjointed. Um, when you said that they they're kind of they're all spread out, that kind of made sense. Um, in terms of the way the songs are structured and written and um. I think there's maybe just like some production problems for me that make it harder to get into. Like the guitar is just a little too bright. Um, but like, I definitely got what they were doing. Um, and there were some, there were songs on there that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, just overall it didn't connect for me, but yeah, it's funny. I had quite the opposite opinion. Like you thought it was uh, like not cohesive, I guess, or something like that. But I don't know. To me, the entire album kind of feels like one giant song. In a, not in the sense that all the songs sound the same, but it fe- I don't know. It feels very much like a, a a singular piece for me. Yeah, I definitely. Some songs definitely stand out more than others. Like not for me, and uh, never mind the opening track and company. But I don't know. It this just works for me, and I don't know. It I didn't see it on a ton of lists this year. It wasn't for being a sub pop record it wasn't like pushed super hard that may due to the be due to the fact that the band wound up canceling their tour halfway through it in the middle of summer Ugh. and they have not played a single show since then and they say it's because Ava was diagnosed with some mental health issues and for her sake the band had to come off the road basically yeah so i'm not sure what's going to happen for the band going forward i really hope that she's able to get the help that she needs and then is able to you know maybe reunite with her bandmates or if there were some interpersonal issues with the band you know you never know for sure what the mental health issues stemmed from um but if it if it was related to the you know a bad you know combination of personalities then you know hopefully that it, they can continue on and do something on their own i don't know they're they're so young and they're so promising like i feel like 
they could do so like i love this album a lot and but i also feel like they can do more too going forward yeah it's interesting i don't know i I, i've had a hard time kind of forming words on how i feel about this album you couldn't think of the word words dude (laughs) (laughs) it like i it's one it's it's this album is more of a feeling for me it's not so much like what they're doing individually it's just as a whole it just works for me and i would go back to it multiple times a year um and it has a killer album cover too i don't know if you yeah got to see it's got a very ray pettibone sort of yeah like a ray pettibone off album cover it's black and white it's like this pencil sketch ink sketch drawing thing and i don't know just all together it works for me i don't know i can't explain it i just like it a lot so if you're ready we can go on to our uh to your next one all right well number eight on our list is actually number seven right number you did number eight number mm-hmm. seven number eight oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number seven on the list is the second solo album by brian fallon sleepwalkers mm. anthem uh, you you gas head you <laughs> this is like i said this is the second solo album um seems like that's kind of the future i don't know if there's gonna be another gaslight record they Did it- they reunited for those you know 59 sound 10th anniversary shows this year but that doesn't it doesn't seem like they're they're moving forward with anything else so so weird and they didn't really tour those as far as they could have no no, they didn't. They didn't do anything on the West Coast. I wonder if they like got together. They were like, "Let's see if things are better now." And <laughs> maybe they weren't. And they're like, "Nah, we can't do this." Well, they did a bunch of shows in like the UK. Oh yeah, I don't know. Maybe 2019 is going to wind up being a huge year for because he did have the solo record this year, and maybe he wanted to push that a little harder than. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, he toured on this record. I didn't go see him. I wish I had. Um, it took a minute actually for me to get into this record my first listen there were parts that kind of stuck out as a little odd to me um his last uh first solo record his last album painkillers i really loved that one immediately like from the start it was very stripped down and very americana focused this record he stepped things back up and it's more of a band a full band record the more I listened to it, though, the more I appreciated the ways in which it felt like like a 59 sound sequel without being really hokey. Yeah. <clears throat> like, uh, it felt like a natural extension of the band, like post-59 sound, just in a different direction. Like, um... Well, what's his name still plays with him, right? The, uh, the guitarist? Um... Maybe. I don't know why. Benny? Benny Horowitz is the drummer, was the Gaslight Anthem drummer. He's not on this record. He 
I don't think he toured with him any with the band either. Um, drawing a blank on his name, Alex Alex, Alex Rosamilia had played on tour with him. Um, Alex doesn't show up on this record though. Um, mm-hmm. The most of the guitars uh, are Brian Fallon, obviously. Um, it's his record, and he's a guitar player. Um, he also plays the the keyboards, the, uh, the piano, does vocals, backs, does a lot of his own backing vocals. There is a second guitarist on the record. It's Ian Perkins, who has been kind of the the fifth the fifth uh, Gaslight Anthem, the uh, touring support guitarist, uh, who also he did the um, Horrible Crows records mm. record uh, with Brian. So that was that was their project, and so this is kind of naturally an extension of the Horrible Crows too. I mean, the additional. Uh, uh, personnel on the record: Nick Salisbury on bass, David Hidalgo on drums, uh, Steve Sedelnik does some additional percussion. Uh, there is also a full like New Orleans traditional jazz band uh, <laughs> on on the song "Sleepwalkers," the the Preservation Hall jazz band. Uh, the The record was produced by Ted Hutt, who produced the who produced Fifty Nine Sound. Uh, he did the Horrible Crows record. He did American Slang. I realized he did a lot of side one dummy records around that time. He did like some Chuck Reagan records and he did, um, there was a bunch of other stuff that he, that he worked on. He, uh, also weirdly enough produced the last couple old crow, old crow medicine show records, which is weird. kind of weird. I wouldn't have expected <laughs> that, but so there's, there's kind of that element being there very much seems like, uh, a major contributing factor to how this feels much more like Gaslight Anthem uh, than the last record. So this was an album that was not on my radar at all. Uh, like, I mean, I knew the album existed and everything, but it wasn't an album that I had even listened to until we were talking about putting our lists together. So I didn't listen to it until the last couple of weeks. And like the very first thing I was like, oh, this is like 59 sound. I like, I, do all the rest of the Gaslight albums sound like this? Or is this just like a, a unique throwback to 59 sound i mean there's little elements in the other gaslight records but this one feels very much like he's and and there was a, there was an intentional his songwriting kind of shifted back towards a lot of his clash influences and uh oh yeah there's a really yeah, there's a really big uh influence from the jam and like uh elvis costello on <laughs> this record too especially in a lot of the organ work that really reminds me of of Costello and the attractions, those first couple yeah. Elvis Costello records, which are the only Elvis Costello records I can get into. <laughs> yeah, he really dug in on like, but I mean, there's some there's some other like uh, soul and classic R and B influences that come through a, a little more prominently. They maybe pulled them off a little better better in the rhythm section than than Gaslight Anthem ever did. But I really enjoyed this record a lot, though, uh, and it's something that just kind of like. It drifted in and out for me. Like my my initial reaction was kind of lukewarm, and then I listened to it again, and it really clicked. And then I just kind of stopped listening to it, and then I came back around to it in the last couple months. And there's some great songs on here. Yeah, it's it's a good one if you like Gaslight Anthem, if you like classic Gaslight Anthem, if you're one of those people that stopped listening after Fifty Nine Sound, you should definitely check this one out. As someone who stopped listening after 59 Sound, it's funny that we, for both of our second picks, uh, I didn't quite feel this one that much. Uh, it's funny you didn't feel the fourth one. Yeah. And now I don't feel it. It's funny we both picked in the same spot. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hate it or anything. I was just like, eh, that's cool. I mean, it kind of reminded me of the things that I don't necessarily care about the post-59 Sound Gaslight albums. Like, it just... Oh, no, it's fine. It's there for me. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something about on some of the songs where he gets real loud that's startling. I don't know. <laughs> like he, when he like shouts, uh, it's because he's not shouting the entire song. And then when he does like what is it, the second track on the album, it like starts with him yelling at you, and it's just like, Ugh, what was that? <laughs> it was just it come feel like it comes out of nowhere. So hey! it's just like, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that that. <laughs> like whoa okay i didn't expect that 
But I did like some of the slower moments, like the song Etta James and um, what's the one right after that that's like a Her Majesty's Service. Song. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's like a Clash song. I was like, oh, okay, I dig these. So, uh, I don't know. It's funny. I liked the bigger songs more. <laughs> I liked Forget Me Not and uh, like uh, <clears throat> Little Nightmares. Little Nightmares, that song gets just constantly gets stuck in my head. Um, I really love that riff on My Name is the Night, Color Me Black. Um, and in, and just the general band arrangement on Neptune. Those are those are all the the songs that stick out a lot to me. And then Sleepwalkers, that the title track. I mean, that's got the jazz band, and it's got a it's a really different thing for him. It's it's interesting. I am curious if he if the if the Gaslight thing was kind of like, well, we got to do these shows because it's the anniversary of Fifty Nine Sounds. We got to take advantage of that. But also, he has the new album coming out, so he wanted to do an album cycle with the new album. And so maybe it was like, well, I, he tried to split the year into two, so I don't know. I'd be curious to see if Gaslight does anything in the future, or if it's going to be more. Just He's like, alright, it's just me now. Yeah. <laughs> Going forward. I mean, he, he's the, he was a primary songwriter, Gaslight, so it's definitely, he's the magic element yeah, I so mean, it, it's it's obvious that he's going to be the one who continues their career, you know. If the other guys do, which isn't there a band? There was a band that played Fist this well, year um, as one of them. Alex Rosamilia yeah. plays in Dead Swords, um, which I just don't like the but vocals then, in that band, so I, yeah, it yeah. didn't interest me. I feel like the Gaslight in it, uh, identity will continue with Brian Fallon and not so much with the rest of the band. So No, and I mean, yeah, I mean, that's all him. <laughs> Like yeah, the Springsteen, the Clash, the classic cars and classic amps. Like that's all Brian Fallon. I mean, those are his interests. Um, mm. The I, the oldies never, punk rocker. That that's yeah. Him. I didn't listen to the last solo album, and you said it's more stripped down. So I actually think I would be more interested in that album. To be honest, would you? Which would which do you prefer out of his solo albums? You know, I don't know. I mean. Yeah, I definitely had a more instant, instantaneous connection with the first album. This one actually mm-hmm. took a, a second to get into, so maybe I would still prefer that one. But we'll see over time, I guess, how much I revisit this yeah. record. And I don't know. Yeah, you saying you didn't get into it immediately also makes me think I maybe probably would need a few more listens to it to find the the charm of it. I mean, uh, and you are also a get, but also you are a Gaslight fan. <laughs> yeah. All the way through, and I'm just a 59 Sound fan. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. You never know. All right. So, moving on to my next one. Uh, number six on the list is uh, Soccer Mommy and the album Clean. She's 
this is the most hipster selection on <laughs> on this uh, list because holy shit, is this album everywhere on the uh, best of lists? I it's funny because I follow the Soccer Mommy Facebook and Twitter account, and every day they're sharing like another best of list where Soccer Mommy's album made the list again. So like all the big ones like. Uh, I, Though now I'm blanking on big lists, but <laughs> like your faders and your, uh, I don't know. What are all the trendy music pages? Anyway, it's them and Snail Mail. Like those are the two musician, like two albums that uh, show up on almost every like album of the year list. So Clean came out on Fat Possum Records and Soccer Mommy is primarily the project of singer-songwriter Sophie Allison. She does vocals, guitar, and bass on this album, and there's a couple instances of uh, extra guitar work by Julian Powell and drums by Nick Brown, as well as some keys by Roger Kleinman. I think that's her touring band as well, those people. Maybe the keys are a different member now, but she was uh, originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, she went to a school of the arts in high school, which might explain uh, why she's such a strong songwriter at an early age. She uh, moved to college in New York to study music business and dropped out in 2017. Good call. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> she... Uh, her, she asked her manager if she should drop out. So, <laughs> because her career was taking off, yeah, and she was studying music business, and so, <laughs> so she moved back to Nashville. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you have a manager, you don't really need the degree. <laughs> yeah. Like, you I mean, just pay someone else to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, it, um, she moved back to Nashville, formed a formed a full band, and then like toured the country uh she has toured with paramore and foster the people on that tour she's toured with slow dive and mitski and frankie cosmos and uh yeah just a ton of like very well-known artists right now uh this uh this is a i'm trying to think what you call it it's like a bedroom an indie like a bedroom pop album almost like it uh it's which which is what it started as and in, in college she just wrote songs in her bedroom recorded them and then started playing shows simultaneously and then went and recorded the full album i guess i think the album was recorded after she dropped out it's like a very sparse sounding indie rock album which i think she claims is like heavily influenced by mitski and alex g which is pretty accurate i think think i'm not super into them so i don't know entirely how accurate that much of a comparison is i also saw her compared to liz fair which i thought like oh that's kind of odd and then i went and sampled a little bit of liz fair and i was like oh yeah i see that i I see that that." makes more sense than you think (laughs) and it made me want to go am i gonna get into liz fair in 2019 (laughs) because i think i could very easily (laughs) um uh, like like I said, it, it it's been critically p- praised on a regular basis, and um, showing up next to Snail Mail is not entirely. It, it makes sense because as far as more uh, younger current musicians, Snail Mail is probably closest to what Soccer Mommy sounds like. Um, the songs are primarily about like relationships, but they're written in a way that are very. I don't know. They play out very clearly as she's singing them. They they represent like a very specific type of relationship. Like the song Your Dog is very much about a bad relationship where uh, like the guy doesn't pay attention to her ex- and she's really just around just to show off essentially and she's ignored whenever, you know, whatever what she has to say and uh and then there's songs like Last Girl, which is just basically talking about, you know, her last girl, or her boyfriend's last girlfriend, yeah. and how she feels like she could never be as cool as her and um, live up to her. And I just, there's something about this album. So I follow, I think I follow the Fat Possum Records band camp, 
And what I was doing early on in the year was anytime like a label put up an album, I would like kind of sample a little bit of it. And I remember they put up just a single track from this album. And I don't remember what song it was. It might have been cool. And I was like, oh, I really like this song. And then I found myself going back to that song like two or three more times. And I was like, huh, wow, this is just one song off an album that I haven't been able to listen to the whole thing yet. So I'm definitely going to have to listen to the full thing when it comes out. And I did, and I, I loved it. It's um, it's an album that when I think about putting on an album, I think of this one first a majority of the time. I don't know. There's something about it that just it's grabbed my attention all year long. I, I go back to it consistently. Um, I don't know. I like it a lot. Um, what did you think of it? Um, <clears throat> I kind of drifted in and out on it. Uh, I really only listened to it one time. Um, mm. just as I was preparing th- for this, I knew their name. Like I knew that they were big. Like I saw their name a lot. I didn't realize how big they were, but yeah, I kind of feel like I really liked every other song. Maybe <laughs> like I, I, yeah, there were, there were moments, I guess, where I felt like it, it slipped a little too much into like bedroom demo acoustic mm, I folk. That. Um, there so are there a are handful moments of that I wish that do... had been produced a little more, I guess. But there are a handful of tracks that I think stand out stronger than others, like "Still Clean" and "Your Dog." And I can see the every other being an accurate. Like I listen to this album so many times that every song is like strong for me. But it, even on the tail end of the album, I'm like. Oh yeah, these aren't as strong as the uh, the front half or some of like the other tracks specifically. But it, yeah, I know what you mean. I it, it probably my first couple listens, I felt the same way. Like it was like a fading in and out sort of thing, like dreaming in and out. Like you, oh, this is yeah, this is catching me, and this is uh, this is losing me. But the, this part's dragging me back in. Yeah, I was shocked at how big or how well this album did. Uh, and how often they've been mentioned in articles, and and I'm kind of kicking myself for not going to see them at Motorco a couple uh, like a couple weeks ago, because but the show sold out pretty far in advance, so I was like, ah, damn, I should have gone to the show because I imagine she'll be at bigger places in the future, and you know she fucking toured with Paramore and Foster the People this yeah. year. So I am curious what the future is going to lead because her music. It's great, but I wouldn't compare it to Paramore Foster the People at all. So she seemed like an odd fit for that bill. And I kind of wonder what her future is going to look like. Because, I mean, will she stay in that, like, Mitski range? I mean, she's definitely a singer-songwriter. And her songwriter, like, what she's singing is the main draw, I feel like. So I don't know. I don't, I'd be curious to see. Because didn't Liz Fair have, like, a weird period where people were like, She's a pop star now, or something like that. Yeah, or, something like that. Yeah. So I'm, I worry that's might be what happens going forward. Like she'll get hooked up with a new label and a fancy producer, and maybe her sound will change. But then again, she also toured with Slow Dive, and that's a band that's remained consistent with their sound and didn't change. I mean, it's different, very different scenes, but. I don't know, and Mit- but Mitski's essentially done the same throughout her career, too. So, I don't know. I don't know. How- I'm going to be curious to see what the future holds for her. Um, especially since it is just basically her project. And so, if they put her together with a, a whole new set of other musicians, what would change? Yeah. I don't know. Depends on... Yeah, hey, it depends on how she is as far as, like, a producer or a band leader. <clears throat> mm-hmm. If she's if yeah. she's got a strong uh, grasp on what she wants, um, and yeah. can can manage other people and can produce a record essentially herself, yeah. <clears throat> that's that's kind of that's true. That that would be the true test for her, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I could see if she's not like good at that element, then maybe she'll stay at this level. Yeah. Like you know, she'll if she just continues to be essentially a. I wrote a song. Here, can you play some extra guitar lines on it? Yeah. You know, that type of musician. Or, if, or yeah, I don't know what her personality is like, so maybe, you know. Hopefully she's got a strong enough personality that if she does get, like, under a bigger label, that they are not going to try and, like, push her around and change what made her, this album, so special in the first place. Um, but I also think 
a label would be stupid to try and change her too much. Yeah. Huh. I don't, it'd be weird if we turn on the radio in like two or three years and she's like on a top 40 station. <laughs> but also weirder things have happened. I mean, I don't know. I didn't think Mumford and Son were going to turn into uh, Coldplay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Coldplay with a banjo. Yeah. <laughs> that they barely play <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Well, I guess we could take a break here. Um, we've done. <clears throat> we're about halfway through our. We're halfway through our list now, and so we'll wrap up here. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess we should we'll do, do our it. normal outro. Yeah. So continue following us on Instagram, and Twitter, and Facebook. We're at, at Punk Lotta Pod on all three of those. We have an email. It's Punk Lotta Pod at gmail dot com. Hey, email us your favorite albums of the year. Uh, I went and asked uh, our fr- our dear friend Corey, who co-hosted the our fest episode, and he said I asked him what his favorite albums were, and he said I don't know that they're my favorites, but the two I listened to the most this year were Pusha T's Daytona and Swearin's Fall into the Sun. <laughs> Very opposite yeah. uh, ends of the spectrum there. Uh, but yeah, tell us your favorite album of the year, and um, yeah, join us next week for uh, part two of the best of 2018. All right. And I have no idea what kind of clip we could even put in here at the end. I'm going to stop recording. All right. Ten, nine, eight, 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 eight. 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 Oh, will this horrible year never end? We've never lost a year before, and I'll be damned if we're going to lose one on my shift. <laughs>